Jennifer Kalari, round two. <laughs> <laughs> Last time you were on, uh, episode 23, our conversation, Jen, you and I had talked for like two plus hours. And we, we were just starting to bridge the topic of parenting in in for our teenagers and we both looked up at the clock and we're like holy you know you had a client and we had been going for two hours so we decided that we would park it for another conversation which is today and i'm so happy to have you back on the podcast welcome back thank you thank you i'm excited about this i'm happy to be back so we all at least my opinion is that the real parenting starts in in our teenage years and picking up where we left off last time uh, one of the one of the themes, one of the through lines that we were talking about was this idea that we are as humans, irrespective of age, right? You're a, you're a newborn baby, you're a toddler, you're a teenager, you're a 42 year old woman like I am. And we are hardwired for connection, right? We want love, we want to be held, we want to be told that we matter, we want to be seen, heard, understood. So very quickly, in case the listener has not listened to episode 23, which will be in the show notes, and I highly recommend that you go back and listen to that because it's almost like a prerequisite for our conversation today. But as a, as a brief um, uh, recall, let's talk about uh, mirror neurons, why that's important, and, and let's explain to the listener what your body of work is surrounding the calm technique. Absolutely. So it's, I love how you said that, that we just all want to be loved and seen and heard. That's a, that is an absolute important need that we all have. Um, and because we operate from this place of needing it ourselves, we're not always as good as we think we are at giving it, right? So, um, and there's this understanding that we should just know how to do that naturally with our children, that it's something we just all know how to do. And we all know how to love our kids, there's no question. What we struggle with sometimes is lining up with love versus fear. And we get confused and fear starts to feel like good parenting. But, and listen, it's part of it. And then at Connective Parenting, I really um, think what's lovely about this model is it's about making mistakes. You're going to blow it. Of course, you're going to blow it. Of course, you're going to get afraid and yell and mess it up. And then you go back and you repair it. But the idea is helping parents to connect more to that center, to that voice, to that place of love. So very quickly, a few things to know about the brain is mirror neuron cells are these brain cells in the brain. They were discovered in the 1990s, and they're really the basis for social cognition. So uh, mirror neuron cells light up when we see someone smile, when we see someone cry, when we see someone reach for a drink of water, suddenly we're thirsty. Um, it's what allows us to step into someone else's experience and have um, what's called theory of mind, this understanding, well, that's what that person must be feeling. Um, that's why we can watch a movie and it's a sad movie and we're crying and the person on st screen is crying. We, our frontal lobe knows it's a movie. Those are actors. They're paid. They've stopped the scene 50 times and we've done it 30 times. It doesn't matter. Our mirror neuron cells are pulled into that event. So that's what really makes us human. Um, when a child is born, um, there's a rough map laid down for the brain. There's only a rough map laid down in utero. When that baby is born through interacting with, uh, their parents, their family, their siblings, um, and actually through stimulating the mirror neuron cells, that's how the brain develops. So you're actually the architect of your child's brain. So every time you make a little face and they make a little face and every time your face doesn't match theirs, every time they're sort of matching up these experiences and they're looking to you, we're um, stimulating the brain, we're stimulating those mirror neuron cells. And when that, when that happens in a way that's connected, that's lovely, that we get it right, that our, our, the look on our face matches the look on our baby's face, um, opiates, endorphins, and oxytocin release. And oxytocin is a very powerful uh, hormone slash neurotransmitter um, that does a lot of amazing things. It strengthens the immune system, which I don't know what could be more important <laughs> right now. There's uh, nothing it, more important nope. right now than <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Um, it, it speeds up neuroplasticity. Um, it is a massive cortisol blocker, which is also incredibly important right now. Yeah. Um, and it, it really helps us to regulate. Uh, when you deeply connect with another human being, you get that bounce back. Your own brain gets those beautiful benefits. Um, and it's what connects us to each other, right? It helps us feel what the other person is feeling, which really makes us human and really gives us our, our experience as social beings. So um, that's what oxytocin is. And, and connected parenting, I teach something called the calm technique, which is actually a therapy technique 
Um, but I've broken it down into a way that's usable and doable. It sounds a little easier than it actually is. Um, and it's a way to listen to someone so that you are lined up with their experience. You're lined up with love. You're keeping your fear at bay. You're both receiving the benefits of oxytocin in that moment, and you're able to have a deep, meaningful, beautiful conversation uh, where real learning happens that you can both feel good about. And when you blow it, because you will, you get to go back and redo it. And that's really what the calm technique is. It's about being present, broken down into four um, kind of uh, operations. You're going to connect first, which means your phone down, which means your face needs to um, really demonstrate to that person that you're present, you're listening, you want to get them. Mirroring, which is the, the fundamental skill here, is not about agreeing. It has nothing to do with agreeing or letting somebody off the hook or um, telling them it's okay how they're feeling. It's literally just experiencing with them how they're feeling in that moment with your own agenda out of it. So that's the C, the connection. The A is the affect matching. So the look on your face needs to look similar to the look on their face. Not exactly, because that's weird, but similar. <laughs> so they get that you're with them. And then the listening part is where you choose your words. The words are actually the least important. It's not what you say, it's how you say that matters so much. So you can paraphrase, you can summarize, you can clarify, and you can wonder out loud. And you do that all with the affect and all with the connection. And when you've pulled that all together, you've had a mirroring moment, which is the M. And it's something that you just try to do as much as you can with everybody. I want people to hear this isn't just for your teenagers or your kid. This works on everyone. And it's a beautiful way to operate in the world. And it keeps you lined up with love. I love that. And for, I mean, we did a really deep dive on, on the calm technique in episode 23. So highly recommend people go back and listen to that because it will provide a lot of color and a lot of richness for what we're going to talk about. And one of the things that the calm, like the calm technique and bathing our children, we think about this idea of bathing our children in these reward chemicals. We also bathe ourselves in those reward chemicals, right? We also bathe ourselves in the oxytocin and the bonding. And that helps to propagate. So when you are, when your child is frustrating you, if it's a teenager, uh, as we're going to talk about in this case, it helps you keep the highest version of that child in your mind's eye when you're, and you don't go. So we talked about this idea of love and fear. You don't go to this place like, oh my God, my child is a terror. How did they, how did they come from my body? You know, when you're eight, when you're bathing yourself in those bonding chemicals, you are still able to maintain or to, to reciprocate that bonding and hold that child in the highest version of them so that you can actually connect um, with them. And the calm technique is kind of like the teenage, like I like to, you know, you've described this and I like this, this teenage whispering, right? Like it's a way to not only apply this with a, with a younger child, but the natural thing for a teenager to do, and this is where I want to kind of get into the specifics around the teenage years, is this is the time where naturally, normally, a child will begin to separate from us. They will begin to want to individuate uh, and become their own person. And of course, now their behavior can be a source of triggering. It can trigger you. It can be a source of ongoing frustration. So can we talk a little bit around the, the, the unique, let, first let's paint a picture for, N, for all the parents that are listening that either have a teenager right now uh, who may or may not be driving them crazy uh, yeah. or a child uh, who will eventually be a teenager. What are some, let's, let's, uh, let's help our parents understand what are some of the fundamental differences in the experience of being a teenager today? versus like, I remember my teenage years, but like I was saying to you in the pre-chat, I didn't grow up with Snapchat. I didn't grow up with TikTok. I didn't grow up with all these things. And thank God, because the, the, how I fell on my face and the amount of times I fell on my face, like if that was broadcast to everybody, like, I don't know how I would have dealt with that. So I, I feel like there's this enormous pressure an anxiety provoking kind of environment that our, that our teenagers are, can, can you just walk us through how it's different? I mean, you work with absolutely. so many teenagers, you have a really good handle on this. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's so many layers to this. There really are. So, so let me start with the first layer, which is the brain. 
Then we'll yeah. peel away what we just talked about, how different it is. Because you have to understand the brain in order to stand, understand how, uh, what the teenager is facing right now in this really, first of all, this unprecedented time that we're in, and also just with social media and all, everything that's bombarding the teenage brain. So the first thing you have to know is that it takes 25 years to grow a frontal lobe. Okay, and that's the part of the brain that really operates. It's very high functioning. It's, it's uh, you know, the organizer of the brain. It's the part of the brain that takes perspective. It inhibits, it motivates, it prioritizes. You know, it's the part of your brain that goes, oh, I'd really like to say this to that person, but that's going to have a problem. You know, it's going to hurt their feelings or it'll be a problem for me down the road. And I really want to eat that whole thing, but, you know, that's not a good idea. I should turn Netflix off. And we're constantly parenting ourselves. That, that's ultimately what the brain does is we have the parent of our brain, which is the frontal lobe. And then we have the little kid in our brain, which is the limbic brain that's screaming and yelling and, you know, concerned with survival and danger. It takes 25 years to grow a frontal lobe. So where your teenager might look like you, they might be as tall as you, right? And they or may taller. Sound, or taller. <laughs> yeah. And they sound very mature in many ways. They do not have a fully formed frontal lobe yet. You can't tell them that. You know, one of the things that I enjoy so much about my job, and I just had this conversation last week with a kid that I've worked with for years. And I remember him during his years sort of grade 10, 10 year so difficult with his parents, such a nightmare, like this is really hard. And I remember saying to his parents, the frontal lobe will kick on. It will kick on around 17. And a lot of these things that seem impossible will organ, it will, it will get better. It will. And you, it's sort of like, you wouldn't take your nine month old to walking classes. So they walk earlier. Like it's just going to happen when it happens. And that doesn't mean you stop parenting. But there's a piece of, of, of yourself that you have to keep as a parent where you just have to trust that the frontal lobe will kick on. It will. And of course, his frontal lobe kicked on and he started studying more and being more responsible and being more reasonable and all of that stuff. All the things I told the parents would happen started to happen. And I just finished talking to him the other day. He's now going off to, he'll be going to university in the fall. And I said to him, do you remember the conversation that you and I had when you were in grade 10 and 10th grade? And I said to you, we're going to have a conversation if you're still working with me in a couple of years and you're going to look back and realize that you didn't know everything right now. And there was so much more to learn. No, that's not going to happen. I, mean, I hate when people tell me that. Anyway, so this conversation happened last week and it was so, and I love this part because I get to do this all the time with kids. He's like, oh, I can't believe what I put my parents went through. <laughs> like, oh, I can't believe I thought I knew everything. Like you told me that I would feel this way and I can't believe it. And it, so it, when it clicks on, it clicks on. And there's a certain amount of trust that you just have to have that 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 piece of development will happen. <laughs> it has to happen and you can't rush it and you can't make it happen. You just have to trust. There's this leap that you have to take. And certainly with boys, I call it the caveman phase and it's sort of 13 to 16. With girls, it's more like 12 to 15. By 16, it starts to click on a little bit. It's a little bit earlier for them. Um, so, and that's all brain development. So what we have to understand is frontal lobe piece. Then you also have to understand that the teenage brain has um, many more neuroids, many more brain cells. There's, there's a lot more pruning and clipping and it's almost like it overgrows. And then the brain kind of prunes and clips and organizes, okay, need this, not using this so much. Um, and, and so there's a lot of, uh, the brain handles things very, very differently as a teenager. So it reacts much more to serotonin. They get bored very easily. Um, they, they, they don't predict danger the same way. They actually don't experience danger the same way. And we can probably remember that ourselves. There's this feeling of invincibility. Oh, that's not gonna happen to me. Oh, adults are so stupid. That's, and you can literally show them evidence, show them physical evidence that something could happen. And that, that teenage brain is built to downgrade danger. It really is. So those two things make it really complicated. It's also uh, highly wired for addiction, the teenage brain, because it needs um, to be that excitement. It needs to be thrilled. And, and maybe that's, I don't know, maybe on a huge scale developmentally, we needed our teenagers to be the warriors and the risk takers and the people pulling us out of whatever rut we were in. Um, and then developmentally, the brain needs to kind of adapt to the environment that it's in. So that used to be mitigated by a few different things culturally. So if you go back maybe a hundred years ago, there was a, and, and many cultures still in the world today, there's a different hierarchical setup. 
which mitigates that, what we just talked about. So I guess the best way to think about it, okay, so let's think of it this way. Teenagers are, okay, the adolescence is not actually a thing. It, it, it's, a, it's, an, it's a Western phenomenon. It's not like a developmental stage. It's not. Like a, a unique, yeah, yeah. It's not. So, so in most places in the world, and certainly 100 years ago, you were a child, and then you were an apprentice adult. And so you desired to be accepted by the adult community. You wanted to prove that you were a man. You wanted to prove that you were a woman. You know, boys went out and they, you know, finished school around 13, 12 or 13, and they apprenticed. And they worked alongside their uncles and they wanted to show how strong they were and they had a role and, you know, they really uh, aspired to be an adult. And a hundred years ago and maybe whatever, girls, the same thing. They had their truth. I think it was called a trousseau where you had like a trunk that had all the things in it that you would need when you were an right. adult. You were building that, mm -hmm. um, all those materials and things you were going to need when you got older and you, you wanted to be, you know, wanted to impress your aunts and your grandparents and there was an, an aspiration again to be an adult and to be accepted in that community and so the brain that was not quite fully formed yet was held it was held and kept safe by the fact that you wanted to please the adults in your life and so you didn't go against adults as much you might have a little bit because the brain is built for that but you were safely held within that adult community as to which you were trying to aspire so the hierarchy was very clear and it mirrored what happens in the brain frontal lobe midbrain and then somewhere, I think the term teenager was actually coined in the 1950s. And so somewhere around the time that kids went on to, and I'm not saying high school is a bad thing, you have to go to high school, but <laughs> they shifted from having a community of adults that teenagers aspired to being included in. And actually they had roles, they had jobs, they had things that were important that helped their community and helped their families. We've lost that a little bit. Um, and so, you know, kids went to high school, instead of having a group of adults that supported them, there was one, and that adult changed every hour, right? So kids started to connect with each other, and they started to want to aspire to be each other. And there was this sense that adults didn't know anything, and th that we needed to rebel against them. And the more adults tried to control them, the more it fit the narrative that they're mean, and they don't know anything, and they're trying to control them. And this rift started to happen, and we were sort of sold this bill of goods that that's normal. It's normal for your teenager to slam the door and not want to talk to you. It's normal for your teenager to be embarrassed by you. And to a degree it is. Um, but, but because that hierarchy has shifted, and that started long ago, that was part of our conversation last time, right? That we've really shifted how we've parented and that children in general have way too much power. So by the time they're teenagers, it's <laughs> way too much power. Um, and then you, on top of it, we have this idea that teenagers don't want us. Um, it's, it's contributed to what is an even bigger problem right now with our teenagers. So that um, the teenager going upstairs, slamming the door, shutting the, you know, leave me alone, you know, kind of thing, which does happen and it is fairly normal, is attachment behavior. So they want you to follow them upstairs. And then when you fall, get out, leave me alone. You know, and then when you leave, they're actually upset. What, she left? I'm going through something. My mother needs to come back. So there's this push, pull, push, pull, go away, come back. I need you get out kind of uh, craziness that happens with those teenage years um, that you know, seems insane, but it is kind of the pattern. It's accentuated now because we don't have teenagers really aspiring to be adults. In fact, we're in such a youth obsessed culture. Uh, we don't even value our elders. We're, we, you know, we treat the older people in our, in our culture right now horribly. And we've lost this important idea of the wealth of information that our elders can share. Um, and we've lost our own sense that we can, you know, are of value to our teenagers and we can really teach them things. Um, they think they know everything. So it's a bit of a mess. So there's that layer, which we can unpack to. And now we add, well, wait, and then we add how they've been parented, which you and I talked about this the last time that they, we really, there's been such a shift in parenting that we're afraid to say no. You know, there's really been struggles that all of us have had around limit setting. You know, kids have a lot of stuff. They've been given a lot of, you know, have a lot of privileges. They push back tremendously against adults. Um, you know, there's a lot of confusion in the, in the parenting world around, you know, do you set limits? Do you consequence? Is that mean? Versus, you know, understanding where you're coming from and understanding the child and 
showing compassion and understanding and knowing your own trauma and your own issues. And it's one of the things I'm most proud of at Connected Parenting is we really bring both of those uh, huge elements together that of course you have to be understanding and compassionate and know your triggers and know your limits, but you have to be a good frontal lobe. You're not mean, you're a frontal lobe. And their job is to push back. No, you're mean, I hate you. And you have to love them enough to be that solid, predictable frontal lobe, no matter what they're throwing at you. So now we sort of highlighted how complex this is. Now you add social media, right? Now you add Snapchat and Instagram and all of these likes and these obsessions and the, the frantic need to be seen and to be validated through social media um, has caused a lot of problems. So when, you, you know, I'm older than you, but certainly when I was a kid, if I had a fight with my best friend, I would stomp to the bus stop, not sit there thinking about that fight while I was waiting for the bus. Then I'd get on the bus and I'd think about it while I was on the bus. And then I'd think about it while I walked up to my house. And then I'd have to think about it for an hour while my sister was on the phone because we had one phone. By the time I got the phone, I was over it. I'd forgotten about it. And my own frontal lobe that was growing and developing started to kick in. And maybe I shouldn't have said that. Maybe that wasn't the best choice. You know, maybe I would do that in the same situation. We were able to access the part of our brain that was growing and developing that allowed us to have that distance. Um, and we might talk to our parents or we might talk to our sister, but there was time. And now teenagers are having these fights and these conversations in real time, like lightning speed. They are having these fights and these disagreements with each other. And by the time they've had this agreement, 30 other kids are involved in that disagreement and they've all weighed in and there's, and, and it's, it's insane. It's, it's overwhelming for kids. Things can, can absolutely catch on fire so quickly that wouldn't have even been known about before. And you said, you said, you know, as a kid, you fell on your face. Literally, if you fell up the stairs now, or you dropped something or spilled something on yourself, there'll be five cameras yeah. filming you and you, it's there. It's out there to be looked at and laughed at and shared and everything else. And, and sent can- to the entire class. Right. Like, look what happened today after school. Yeah. 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 And that anxiety has c- contributed to, I think, epic, epic levels of social anxiety. If I'm seeing anything like massively on the rise, it's social anxiety and depression. Those two mm-hmm. things uh, mm-hmm. are, are mm-hmm. kind of catching on like wildfire right now. So the other thing that's important to know about um, social media and video games I think we touched on this the last time, but it's important to bring it up here because it's such a huge part of teenagers' lives, is that dopamine, which is really meant to reward the brain for doing something boring and tedious and hard, like fishing or ga- hunting and gathering or you know anything, um, that, that, that reward is meant you know, to have you, oh, that was boring, but I got a reward, so I'm gonna do that next time. The brain is also designed to, um, to desire that thing again, right? Like it, 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 so dopamine is actually a part of addiction. So you, dopamine receptors die in the brain. So I need more of that thing the next time to motivate me to do that boring thing again, because it's really boring and I remember how boring it is. So the reward needs to be even greater. So comp- you know, apps, uh, social media, video games, they're all designed to keep this dopamine pumping, to keep rewarding the brain, bathing the brain in these levels of dopamine that we were never meant to have. And so the other thing that's happening is kids get bored very, very easily. Nothing excites them. Nothing is interesting. Part of that's our fault in terms of how we parented, that the second they got bored when they were two, three, four, five, we stuck something, you know, here's my phone. Here's an iPad. Oh, you're uncomfortable. Let's buy you something. Oh, you're uncomfortable. I'll fix it. Right. So that's been a big problem. That's been a brain in the making that was primed for this. Um, And now we sort of, and and we're at the time that we're having this conversation, we're in this period of of social isolation. So screens are all kids have right now. It's the only way that they can connect to each other. And younger kids are being exposed to this at an age where they normally wouldn't have, right? So they're now texting each other about things and communicating with each other and you ghosted me and you didn't answer and like all of the drama that comes with this, younger and younger kids right now are exposed to because we have no choice because our world kind of has to be digital right now. 
The only thing that I will say that I'm noticing with my teenagers that I work with is it has shifted slightly from uh, the social marketing, look at me, Snapchat, quick poses to actual conversations, to house party, to, you know, Zoom conversations where they're actually talking to each other, which if there's been a really positive shift at that. Well, that's great. Yeah. Right? One, of the, one of the things that I've always been, you know, when you think about addiction, just kind of following up on that idea, I, I think it's really normal for, uh, in particular boys, and we can talk about this in, in terms of girls and boys, but to consume copious amounts of carbohydrates, <laughs> right? And as a woman who runs a nutritional program that talks about the benefits of fat and how cholesterol is a structural component of the brain and we need fats and we need proteins for satiety, um, I have a teenage boy and it's hard to see, all, he just wants the carbs, like wants, wants, wants the carbs. And I think that that is... Um, a necessary part of his development, but it also feeds into this idea of addiction, right? Like, because the simple processed carbohydrates give you that serotonin rush and production in the gut. And of course, we know that serotonin uh, then, of course, leads to uh, dopaminergic activation. So um, maybe we can just stop there, touch on that for a minute, because I know that, uh, and I want to talk about dieting as a, as a, when we get into, I want to talk, have a robust conversation around some of the common issues that teenagers face. I know that dieting, particularly for girls, is a thing. But can you comment on, you know, should a should a parent like myself, who is a 15 year old now, who loves his carbs, but knows that, you know, he he and he'll eat like he does eat avocados and eggs and things like that, but just has an unsatiable appetite for the carbs. Is there? do I have a reason to be concerned or does a parent who may be listening going, yeah, that's my kid. Like all they want is the ice cream, the processed foods, the pastas, the breads. So again, my answer is always so layered because I think part of it, given the, the period of time that we're in, there's so little that kids feel that they have right now that they have control of over. First of all, there's two things teenagers tell me right now are the only things they feel they have control over. One is sleep which is why they're all up till four or five in the morning because yeah. it's when the house is quiet. It's the only time they feel that they have any privacy, any agency. Um, and they're all awake. They're all awake. Unless you've taken their phones away, they are up till three, four or five in the morning talking, having conversations um, and then sleeping all day. So sleep is one and the other is food. Right. And, and certainly carbs are highly addictive and, and the same you know, when I talked about dopamine and needing more of the same thing to get the same thrill you got the last time, the same is true for sugar, the same is true for carbs, um, tech. Uh, apps, tech, everything. So uh, buying stuff, it's the same thing. It always leads to addiction. Dopamine always leads to addiction. Um, serotonin and oxytocin, they lead to happiness. So we've kind of confused happiness and pleasure. That's been one of our, the biggest problems in our culture in the last you know, many, well, maybe forever, but certainly much more in the last 20 years. Um, so dopamine leads to pleasure and serotonin and oxytocin lead to happiness. So part of the answer to that, so remember I talked about the caveman stage? It's really common, especially for boys in this stage, to, they, have sleep, they have agency over sleep, so they'll fight you over sleep and they'll fight you over food. And they want those carbs, it's all they want, nothing else tastes good. That's how it works, I'm telling you, like the more carbs you eat, the more carbs you want and nothing else tastes satisfying at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so what, ha and, and it's one of those things, you, you can't tell me what to eat, right? I'm a teenager now, you don't know. And plus right now is an interesting time because we actually do have control over what our teenagers eat. When they're in school, we don't. So we can have a house full of healthy things, but they can go to school and buy whatever they want in the cafeteria. So it's one of the things that drives um, parents crazy when they've taken such care for their kids to eat organic food and healthy that the kid just goes and buys French fries and drinks pop and, and eats garbage at school. And so you'll see often part of that caveman stage is, and this is a frontal lobe thing. Adults can barely do this. So imagine when you don't have a fully formed frontal lobe. Yeah. So what often happens is they're terrible, terrible eaters and it kills us as parents right? And then around 19, 20, 21, now they have this interest in going to the gym and eating properly. And your 20, 23 year old will be sitting at the table telling you why you shouldn't be eating this and why all this <laughs> thing you taught them to do, they're now doing. 
So I'm not saying back off and let them eat whatever they want. I'm saying keep a piece of your soul that knows that some of this is developmental. And that if you make it a fight and you make food this thing that you battle over, you're going to create a whole other problem that you're trying to solve by getting your child to eat healthy, right? You don't want to associate food and fighting, either pleasing your parents by what you eat or destroying your parents by what you eat. That's a very dangerous pattern. So at this point, we're in an unusual time where you can just not have the stuff in the house. What are they going to do? They can't leave. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to go with your mask and no money. Yeah. (laughs) Right. So that, I mean, when are you going to ever have this time again where it's just not in the house? Mm -hmm. Like it's just not there. Um, Or you can just have smaller amounts of it in the house. Um, The other is think about adding the stuff that you do want them to eat versus taking away the stuff that you don't want them to eat. And really think about the serotonin, the oxytocin, the, those beautiful reward chemicals that they're going to eat, um, that, that, that they're, they're going to experience um, just from being around you, right? So the happier they feel and the better they feel, the less they need to fill that hole inside with something else, whether it's video games or potato chips or whatever it is, right? Think about adding that, those elements to the teenager's life. And it's really hard. They do not make it fun. They are nasty and sullen and like teenage boys, that caveman stage, they don't even talk. How was your day? (laughs) Such like my, my, my 15 year old go. Yes. That's his answer. How was your day? Yes. Yes. (laughs) You know, or it's like, Oh, okay. Right. I mean, that's it. That's what you're going to get. And so you have to find ways to connect anyway. You have to see, through that um, veneer that in there is a little person that is, and here's the other thing, Steph, that's so important. They are worried about things that we never even had to think about. Mm. And I know they're thinking about this stuff because they talk to me, right? They're they're literally, is there going to be a world that I'm going to recognize? Is global warming going to wipe us out? Am I going to be dead by 30? Am I even going to have kids? Like these are things I'm telling you that when they can't sleep at night, this is what they're thinking about. Yeah. And I think, you know, again, why it's so important to go back and listen. I think this is especially true of our gladiator kids. Like I have a nine and a seven-year-old that are like, is coronavirus going to wipe us all out? Like, am I never going to, am I like, when, when are we going to die? You know, these questions that you're like, Jesus, how, like, how is this seven-year-old thinking of these things, you know? Um, And for, I mean, for the most part, the adults can't even figure that out. Like we don't even know what's going on. Right. So um, I, I love what you're saying around this idea that the frontal lobe is not developed until 25. Um, when we look at the body, especially the central nervous system of which the brain, of course, is a part of, the skeleton also matures at 25. So the skeleton and the nervous system kind of go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. And it makes a lot of sense what you're saying because we also, in our teenage years, there is a neurological kind of spurt, right? Like we have this hormonal uh, explosion. We have the pressures that we've been talking about, like the social media and the anxiety. And, you know, it's, it's really no wonder that, and they're just little people, right? And their frontal lobe sometimes on, sometimes it's off, right? It's, it's no wonder that sometimes we have these like emotional like grand mal seizures, right? Like these emotional meltdowns um, on on things that we might think are like not important, but are incredibly and exquisitely painful um, for these kids. So I wanted to move into something that you call the emotional or emotion as your GPS. Like how yeah. can we help our kids? Because even though right now we have a lot of control. So, you know, lockdown, kids are at home, we can control their environment. It can become this like really great laboratory, like random, you know, controlled trial. We can have this really great thing. But at some point the kids, we are, they're going to go back to school, you know, uh, gatherings are going to happen again. How can we help our kids make better choices and help them set boundaries in terms of what they are and what they are not comfortable with. What can you yes, deconstruct absolutely. that a little bit for us? I can. And, and what's so important about the teenage years and that what we've kind of been sold this idea that teenagers don't want us around when I'm telling you, when I talk to teenagers, they will, they'll talk about social media and they'll talk about stressors and they'll talk about bullying and they'll talk about all the things that we kind of think they're talking about, but this, this much what they're really talking about is the parent. 
my mother's mad at me. They love my siblings more. They don't care about me. They, you know, they, everything that my brother does is great and what I do is crap. Like that is what they're talking about. They're still talking about us, right? And, and we wouldn't know that when they slam the door and go leave me alone, right? Mm -hmm. So at, the hardest part is that you have to parent through that, that feeling that your kids just don't want you around. And part of that is, the social media stuff. They're so addicted to their devices that we're like in the way of them, first of all. The others that they're so desperate to connect with their peers, but also developmentally, they're in this stage where we're kind of embarrassing. It's like, oh, don't, oh, don't, you know, you go to the mall and they're like, pretend you don't know me. Like you're so embarrassing, right? And we, we get so hurt by that and that feels so devastating. And it does, you've given everything to this little one who would sit on your lap and tell you everything. And oh, mommy, you're so beautiful. And like that, it turns into, you're embarrassing, leave me alone. It's very hard and there's no way to prepare a parent for that switch. And a lot of parents will say, oh, I can't even imagine that happening. I can't imagine my, my child switching that way, but they do. And there's a loss, there's a grieving sometimes that the parent goes through when your child pulls away and separates from you that way. And so what we do is we get angry, right? And we knock on the door and they're like, get out. I can't believe you talked to me like that after all I've done for you. And we end up in these like conflicting things, right? And, and it's so complicated, but what happens is the, the child loves you and they miss you and they're terrified that they're separating from you. And so they, it's easier to separate you from you by hating you, right? It just is. Yeah. If they and, construct this, like my mother is evil, it's much right. easier to separate from the evil mother rather than, no, I'm growing up now and it's time for me to. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And then it, it gets complicated by all the other layers that we talked about, but um, and then we get hurt and we get angry and we keep feeding that role. Remember too, that the frontal lobe isn't fully formed yet. Mm. So they're getting, a, they're literally getting an adrenaline hit by they, they're dealing with a lot of stuff. They are carrying around a lot of heavy, difficult things right now that they don't know what to do with. So what they do is they get into a fight with us and then we get into this whole thing and then they get a blast of adrenaline, which actually lights up the frontal lobe, just like Concerta and Fiance and, 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 uh, ADHD medications. So they are regulating off of us, right? Which is, which is a, a, a necessary to a certain degree, but also a very dangerous pattern and cycle to get into. Right. And the parent is in the corner rocking, you know, in the yeah. position and then the kid's like kind of over it. Right. It's yeah. also a time where it can trigger our most devastating traumas, yeah. right? Yeah. Our, our most hurtful times, our own stuff that we carry around gets really heavily triggered by our teenager who we've given everything to who is now treating us like garbage. Right? It, you have to hold on to such a sense of yourself when you are parenting a teenager. It's really difficult. And, and kids that you would never think would turn out this way, that wouldn't have these years do. Not always, but often, or at least a degree of it, right? And the kids know your triggers too, right? It's, like, it's, not, like, it's not like they just randomly push buttons. Like they know where the buttons push and they know where, where it hurts the most. Yes, yes. Yeah. and they simultaneously hate themselves for pushing those, those buttons. Yeah but yeah. can't stop. Right. And they need to hate you. So they, we walk into the trap every single time. Right. So I think I would have said this the last time that yelling, uh, there is no circumstance in which yelling is helpful. Maybe if your little one is about to cross the street and you're start, look out, like, mm -hmm. Hey, but otherwise not really. Right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we can't think of a time in our lives where someone has screamed at us, yelled at us, bawled us out, reprimanded them us. And we've gone, Oh, thank you. That was fantastic. That's exactly <laughs> what I needed. Thank you. Like, it's yeah. never going to happen. You're going to get defensive. Your own limbic system that is responsible for survival is going to kick in and you're going to have a limbic response. You're going to have a reaction to that moment instead of a response to that moment. So it, humans are so messy. Like we're just beginning to unpack like the crazy layers here, right? So to simplify this, the best thing that we can do is line up with love. And that is incredibly difficult to do, but it is the best thing to do for your child and it is the best thing to do for you. And for that, you need your own frontal lobe, right? Accessing how you would have felt as a 13 year old, understanding that this is brain development, understanding that they're regulating off of you. When you do yell and you will going back and saying, you know what? I lost it yesterday, but I was thinking about what your life looks like right now and how you're missing your friends and all of that. Go, go back in there and have that conversation with them. It's, it's that dopamine, it's, it's the serotonin and the oxytocin that you need right now. You need to build that to help to give them resilience against everything else that's happening in the world right now. 
So I have a brain that goes in 5,000 directions and I've already forgotten the question you asked me. Where were we going with this? How do we, <laughs> how do we help our children make better choices? Better so choice. I wanted okay. to talk about the GP, like just kind of that internal right. attunement. Like how can we, you know, the kids are right now, like I said, they're not, they're not socializing. There's no prom, there's no this, but there will be parties. There will be, you know, drugs, alcohol, sex, stuff, you know, and if a child is feeling ambiguous about something, I mean, part of parenting is about surrendering and letting go, but how do we, how do we arm our children with making better choices and attuning into what feels right for them? I love that. Okay. So all of that, that I just said does lead into it. So I didn't yes. lose track completely. <laughs> so the thing is you have to be that compass facing north for them until they have a frontal lobe that's fully formed on their own. They need yours. You are the substitute frontal lobe. You're not mean, you're a frontal lobe, but that ability to be your child's frontal lobe will only work if there's connection, right? If it's based in love, if it's based in closeness, then that compass facing north is going to be what they line up with. So when they go to a party and they get out of the car and you, you better do this. And you know, if I find out that if that's what you've left them with, when they go in the car, uh, when they leave the, the car and go into that party, the second somebody says, do you want something? What do you think that child, that kid is going to say? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. Right. If you drive them there in love, trusting in them, showing that you have faith in them, reminding them of how loved they are, how important they are, and that you trust that there's difficult things out there and they're going to have difficult decisions to make, but you trust in the core of who they are. They're going to get out of that car and somebody's going to hand them something and they're going to go, no, thanks. Or fine. I'll just have a little, right? You're going to be present at that party. Okay. You can't be in the window going like this. That's creepy, but you're going to be right here, right? In this place of love and belief and understanding, that's how they're gonna feel valued enough and loved enough to make good choices. And that is true with, if, you're, if you have a daughter, the boys that they choose, uh, if you have a son, the, how they treat women and girls, uh, how, how, if they try something they've been offered. Um, these are, these, this is all you have. This is why if you don't have a teenager, it's so important that you get good at this stuff because you're gonna need it in the teenager right? So that's the compass facing north. And it's also important to understand, like with the calm technique, the oppositional behavior can't really happen if there's no opposition. If you're not, if you are doing the, you better not try, if I find out, you blah, 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 you know, that is going to, I mean, you tell me, I'm an adult. If you say you can't do something, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to find a way to do it as an adult. With a fully, maybe, and maybe we can argue that my frontal lobe is not fully formed, but like that would be my reaction. Like, so you're going to tell someone who is underdeveloped still in terms of their neurological maturity, you better not, you better, they're going to, you know, and it's, you say this in your book and we'll put the, we'll put the book, uh, link in the show notes, but the book is called you're ruining my life, surviving the teenage years with connected parenting. Um, you talk about this idea of being the parent that they would not want to disappoint. Yes. Yeah. Which I think yeah. is so lovely because it's not like you better do this, you better line up. It's not based in fear. And I can't remember who, it might've been Oprah. Someone was like, there's two kind of different emotions. You operate out of fear yeah. and that's, you know, I'm anger and all. Love and fear. That's it. Love and fear. else is fear, right? Gossip, yeah. yelling, screaming. So when you are panicked and driving your kid to that party and doing this the whole way there, mm. that's based in fear. They're also going to be picking up on your fear. The limbic system, which has no idea of how to process anything other than fear, is now in fight or flight mode, right? And the kid gets out of the car in an escalated, elevated state. When you drive there in that sort of, um, in, that, in that state aligned with love, right? Um, that's the feeling the child is going to have when they step out of the car, right? And that, that's the most important thing. We do this all the time. We, we parent from this place of fear. Don't you know that I love you? No, that doesn't sound like love. Yeah. That sounds like anger, right? That sounds like fear to me. So whenever we're operating from that place, it is never going to work the way we hope it's going to work or the way that we think that it's going to work. Um, teenagers, especially, um, have this sense of that they're trying to figure out what they have control over and what they don't. 
right? And, and they don't have a lot of roles. Like even when I was a kid, I had a, I had a job. Like you'd be shocked at how many teenagers don't have their license and don't have a job. Yeah. And there's a million reasons why, but part of it is we've kind of kept uh, teenagers. Ironically, since they have so much access to information we never had, and they have so much knowledge that we never had, but they are far less mature than we were. Like, I remember taking the subway. I grew up in Toronto at 12. I took the subway down to the Eaton Center with my friends. We had all of the, and nobody panicked. We didn't have a cell phone. Mm-hmm. Like we had this idea that we were practicing being adults and the world wasn't so dangerous and it's not actually more dangerous now. We just think it is. It's actually less dangerous. Um, and, and we had all of this independence. We didn't, our parents didn't know where we were half the time. I, every single kid at 16, the minute we turned 16, we got our license. We had bank accounts and, and, and a, no, a lot of kids are not working. These days. They're not driving. Mm-hmm. They don't care. Why am I going to drive? I have Uber. My parents right. pick me up all the time. Like they don't care about having a license. Right. And very few of them have jobs, maybe summer jobs at a camp possibly, but mm-hmm. very few kids actually have jobs throughout the year. And part of that is, Oh, you've got to get, you know, amazing grades to get into you know, university and college, and we've got to make school number one, and we have to make getting into university number one. But all of the life skills, all those important things you learn by practicing being an adult and maneuvering in the adult world, we're keeping them babies until they go to school. So they've been driven and tutored and helped and supported until we drop them off in first year university. And that's why tw- I think it's 25% of, of university kids bomb out in the first semester. And I'd argue that. I had a job the second I turned 16. I had back, I don't know what it's like now, but there was like a G1 and then a G and then I had to go for my G2 and then my G, whatever it was for my license. And I had timed it. So the minute I turned 16, I could have the, you know, the G or whatever it was where I didn't need to um, have a parent in the car with me. But I would argue that you will do better at school (laughs) if you learn time management skills. Right. But some of the things that you were saying, like the life skills that it affords you, like how, how hard it is to actually make money, the value of savings and how to budget your time appropriately, like understanding, okay, I have this exam coming up. It's in two weeks. How much, where in my schedule do I need to work? Where do I need to be able to plan out? So I have some quiet time so I can study and then balance all the other, you know, responsibilities in whether it's academic or otherwise, uh, you know, in your family or what have you. I, I think that there's so much to be learned from uh, some of these simple things that you're saying that we don't, that our, our teenagers now don't no. have. And I would, I would also say too, just on the, you know, with the kind of back to the example where you were saying, you know, if you're in the car and you're like, you better not do this. You better. We also, also just want to remember when we were teenagers, like teenagers experiment, right? Like they play with like, they're kind of like, all right, I'll try, I'll try this little smoke. I'll try this little thing. And that is, I would, I mean, I would love for you to elaborate on it, but I think that that's part of a normal, like, does this feel good to me? Does it not? Like they're kind of creating a template for what aligns or doesn't align with their values. Yeah. And maybe we can bridge that with a discussion on what happens when your child doesn't make, you know, so we, we, we want to develop this internal, this emotional GPS that you were talking about, which is fostered through connection, being this parent that we don't want our kids to, uh, that our kids don't want to disappoint, but our kids are going to make bad choices. They are going to fail. Can we talk about the, if you think there is a gift in failure, if you think that there is lessons or uh, things that come into play, like, should we bail them out? It, when do we draw, well, like, where do we draw the line with that? Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. Mistakes are how human beings learn, right? They, they are. And failing and figuring out what to do is part of being healthy and part of being human. Um, part, it's interesting. I'm going to divert just for a second because video games are a really interesting thing here, especially for boys. It's the only place in their world where they have control over everything, but they fail a lot in video games, mm-hmm. a lot, and they'll stick to it. So if, they, if we could take that and apply it to real life, it would be incredible, right? So what happens as a, as a, in all of us is we d- figure out who we are through failure, and then we figure out the brain um, is likes to polarize. Well, this is bad and this is good. And so if we've raised our kids in a bubble and never let them fail, 
and never let them make mistakes and stayed up to one o'clock in the morning and helped them do that project. So they handed it in, got an A. Um, we're so afraid to let our kids not do well that we are robbing them of critical, critical brain development, actually, um, that can help them. The best thing you can do for your child is say, I love you so much. And I love you enough to figure out what happens when you don't hand that assignment in or when you rush and do it two hours before it's due. I love you too much to stay up till four in the morning and, and make it look like an A when it shouldn't be. Because that's not how life works. I'm going to bed. Like you don't have to do it now, figure out yourself what's gonna happen. Like when it's, when it's delivered that way, it's fear-based. When it's delivered like this, this is killing me. You have no idea how much I wanna stay up and help you figure this out. But I can see that there's more value in letting you figure out what happens when you leave things to the last minute than there is in me helping you till two in the morning. Right? Now, again, it's nothing's that simple. If something's gone on in their life that's been terrible, if they've had a tragedy, if there's, they've just been dumped by their girlfriend or what, if something big has happened, help them. That's okay. But, but make sure that it makes sense. Weigh that against what's really important in that moment. And that is true love. That is true love, right? So you, you mentioned a few minutes ago, um, looking at emotions as the GPS system. Mm -hmm. Right? So what happens when kids procrastinate, for example, and this is just one choice kids can make, um, it's, not the, it's not the doing of the assignment that causes the anxiety and the stress. It's actually the not doing it. Right? So while they're putting it off and putting it off and putting it off, the anxiety is building. It's building and it's building and you feel disgusting and you feel gross and you don't know what that is. So you just try to drown it out with more video games or pot or whatever kids are doing. Right? But that feeling is coming from not from their own um, emotional GPS, not facing north. They're not going to feel better until that thing is done. But the more they avoid and procrastinate, they think it's the actual assignment that they don't want to do. And this, this is a chronic thing. I do a lot of work around procrastination in teens and young people. And procrastination is actually a form of anxiety. Right? So, so that, that's one choice. Um, anytime they are drinking or um, smoking pot or whatever it is, if they are lined up with love and they feel you there at that party and they know who they are and they know who they don't want to be and they know they don't want to be that person that ends up vomiting all over the place at the party, um, they'll experiment and then they'll have an internal sense of that's enough. Mm -hmm. I'm, good. I'm gonna go home. I'm gonna hang with these people over here that aren't, aren't quite so wild. They'll have a strong sense of who they are in that situation. It still may be pushing boundaries that you would like them to push because teenagers do experiment and it's how they figure out who they are. But they'll they'll line up eventually with with who they want to be. And if they do make a mistake, they'll look at it and go, "Ooh, I feel disgusting now. I feel horrible. That's not me. That's not who I want to be. I never want to be that person again." And then they'll line up with that choice again the next time. When there's a hollowness inside, when there's an ache, when there's pain, when there's depression, when there's anxiety, when the, your child is really struggling, things like marijuana and drugs and video games and shopping and whatever it else it, it is, it's going to be filling a hole. And when you're doing those things to fill a hole, now you're having a different experience with that thing, right? So there is nothing more important than your relationship with your child, no matter how they are suffering, no matter how far off the track you think they are, they, if they are off the track, they are in pain. And if you yell at them and scream at them and threaten them and take everything away and, and it comes from a place of absolute fear, you'll drive them more into that thing. You can still set limits. You can be very powerful limit setter with your children, but do it with love. Maybe you can be as mad at me as you want. I can see that this is not who you are. I know you. This is not who you want to be. So I'm not going to make this easy for you. Right? I'm not going to give you money so you can go buy that. I'm not, that, that is so different from you think you're getting out of this house. I'm, I know what you're up to. I'm seeing your phone. Like that, whenever it comes from that place, it's never going to work. Never, never, ever. Yeah. I think this is one of the hardest things around parenting a teenager and to your point before you'd mentioned, you know, the triggers and you have to, as a parent, if you want, if you are interested in parenting your child in the way that they deserve to be parented, it is worthwhile that you work on your own stuff, right? Your own triggers, because there is nothing as a, you know, I, I think about my kids and, you know, for like, for example, I was bullied as a child, like bullied through grade school, bullied in high school, like, you know, the whole thing. And <laughs> 
you know, we can, we can talk about some of the ways of bullying. I want to talk about bullying today, like the different sure. ways that we're bullied yeah. or ki- kids are bullied now, but it was painful. And I, and, and it was, it was painful, but from that pain, I grew, I became determined. I became, um, you know, uh, driven. I learned to re- rely on myself. The amount of grit that I developed self-reliance and even just hunger. Like part of that is like, you, you know, it, it, you, whenever I, I think it was Tony Robbins, someone was like, you know, if you want to blame your parents, you also got to thank them too, right? Like all the bad things they did, they also did some good stuff. Like I have to thank those people that ostracized me, made fun of me, blah, 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 blah because all of those things came from that. And if I were, if I were to see my kids go through that, my first instinct would be, where's my magic mummy cloak? Let me just protect them because I don't want them to feel that. But that is robbing them of, and you've been talking about frontal lobe and like the development of the frontal lobe, like thinking about, you know, resilience, planning for the future, uh, being driven. Those are all neurologically associated with your frontal lobe. And if we want our kids to make better decisions, we have to allow them to feel pain. Now the suffering, you know, you don't, have, you know, it's like the quote, like pain is, uh, when something like pain is in, is imminent and suffering is optional or suffering is optional. Mm-hmm. Everyone's going to feel pain. And the more that you try to, um, cloak them, like throw that magic, invisible yeah. Harry Potter cloak, you know, the invisibility cloak or whatever around them, the, the less likely they're going to be resilient and, and being able to figure out stuff feel later the more yeah. pain they will feel later and the deeper that pain will be from smaller things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so truly, and, and I don't want anyone to go through bullying. It's horrible. And it's a trauma that stays with you it, well into adulthood. It really does. Yeah. Um, however, and this is true in anyone's success. If you stay in the place of a victim, then you will suffer. You will. If you can turn yourself into a student, what did I learn? How's this going to make me better? How am I going to protect other people from this? How can I be a force in the world that changes this for other people? If you see yourself in a power position, that's going to change everything. So that's a really important thing um, for parents to know when, when your child is going through something terrible without invalidating the pain, which remind me and I'll come back to that. Mm-hmm. Um, but contours and contrast is essential. It's part of being human. It's part of figuring out who we are. You know, coming back to video games again, if some kid played a video game that they always won, how long would they play that video game for? Like, that's not fun. You're not Mm going to play a game with someone that you beat over and over and over again. That's not fun. The fun comes from making mistakes and failing and and setting a goal for yourself and achieving that goal. And, And if we whitewash our children's lives, we're robbing them. We're actually neurologically causing damage. We are causing them. The brain grows in accordance to the environment that it finds itself in. So if a brain is only in la-la land and every problem is fixed and somebody swoops in with their magic cloak and fixes everything, then the brain is not going to develop any neurological hardware that it needs to handle trauma or trouble. It's not even going to be there. Mm -hmm. So I think I might've used this example last time, but if you think about it, if you have a child that you've called every time something went wrong and you called every parent if you thought their child was mean to them and you called the teacher every time their friends were in a different class and all of those experiences and you give your child an ice cream cone and they're nine years old and they're eating the ice cream and it falls on the floor and they're hysterical why are they crying because that is the worst thing that's ever happened to them in their entire life it is we never let them feel anything else so they're having a totally normal reaction to the worst thing that's ever happened to them and then we stand there going what's the matter with you it's an ice cream get over it. So now they're all confused, right? So, and I'm not saying it's Lord of the Flies, kick your kids out and, you know, let them figure it out. But there is such value in making mistakes and there is value in some pain, right? There just is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a really good example is, you know, your child at the beginning of the year being in a different class. Every year, a parent's phone and say, my child's in a different class and blah, blah, blah. And I have seen this for 30 years. I've had three kids of my own. Three days later, I'm telling you, they don't care. And the important thing is they've experienced something that appeared to be devastating. How will I ever recover from this? All of my best friends are in the other class. And now they have three new best friends and those friends. And half the time, they don't even play with the old friends. But the truth is, what did they learn? Something can seem impossible. Something can seem insurmountable. And I can get through it. And I can be happy after it. So it's so important not to take that cloak out. There will be times 
when things are really rough and you do need to come in and advocate for your child. And you'll know those times, you'll know them. Like if you quiet yourself down and you use your own intuition, you'll know, right? But this is, so this is very important. Knowing your own stuff is hugely important. Um, and becoming comfortable to a certain degree with your child's discomfort and even pain and even sadness is so, so important. And again, you can go back to the other podcast for this, but this is why the calm technique is so important because you want to have this whole ability to be present with your child and be present with them when they're in pain or they're angry or they're sad or they've gone through something awful, sit with them in it. Cause if you leap right to, Oh, you know, your pain is what's going to help you. And that's what helped me. You've already forget it. You they're can't not listening. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. And you wouldn't want that either. Like mm. the first part is that you need someone to be present with you and just hold that space for you and love you through it. And, and believe in you enough and see enough glory in you to just sit there and be present in that, right? And then after that, then it's the time for having a conversation around what pain can do for you and, and not being a victim in your life. And, and you, you make a decision in your life, I'm going to let that define me or not, right? At a certain point. Um, and I don't, I don't know that we do a good enough job raising our children to understand that they have agency, that they have much more control over their reality than they think they do. But I don't think that's something we even talk about with our kids. I'm starting to now with the children that I work with and with my own kids, um, you know, really helping them understand the power of belief, you know, and that, there, that there's power in mistakes and, um, and you, you, what you focus on becomes your life, right? Which your life is a mirror of what you think about. It just is. So, and how do we, how do we not, how do we avoid invalidating their pain? So your daughter comes home her boyfriend's broken up with her or she's no longer best friends with her best friend. And for her, the world is over as she knows it. How do we, I mean, my, my thinking would be, you know, the parent is going to want to comfort that child, but we can get, we can get into the weeds a little bit if we're like, oh, you'll find someone new. This is just the beginning. She was a terrible friend. Anyway, how you do, how do we not person in five years, which is not what they want to hear. <laughs> yeah. Five years is an eternity for a teenager. So, I mean, they don't even think, I mean, they don't even think about next week. You can't even, you know, the concept yeah. of time, I think is still abstract even to a teenager. So how can we, how can we avoid invalidating their pain yeah, um, when things seem catastrophic? Yeah. And we have to sit with how catastrophic it feels. That's the hardest part. Our child is devastated right now. I need to make them feel better. So often we want our child to feel better so we can feel better. Yeah. Let's just be honest about that because that's yeah. true and that's okay. And we all do that, but we just have to know that I can't stand seeing my child like this. I need them to feel better so I can sleep. And, and this happens to dad too, to dad also, but I see it so much in moms and I've been there myself where you can't sleep. Like you can't function when your child is destroyed when they've been dumped or they haven't been invited to something or they've been bullied or they didn't get on the team that you want. Like we can't sleep. It's excruciating. It's actually worse when it's happening to your child than it's when it's happening to us. Mm -hmm. So we want them to feel better so we can feel better. And again, that is based in fear and it's never going to work. And your child is going to know that it's going to, so much of this is, um, is subconscious and it's just this gentle awareness that we have of each other. But if it's coming from that place, your child will know it and it's not going to work. So the calm technique, which is such a superpower means suspending your agenda. I can sit with my child in this painful place and I can be present in this moment and I can control my own panic and I can let her or him just vent. And the stuff that they vent is terrifying. It really is but you have to be present and you have to just sit there and you have to allow them. It's so interesting. I had a conversation with Olivia. So my daughter's 16 and she's a big feeler and she's a super gladiator. And I don't even remember what caused this. She was, I ended up staying up till two 30 in the morning with her the other night. And Oh, she has a new boyfriend that she really is enjoying. And part of a bigger conversation is kids have no attention span anymore. So they, they're even at the age of 16 and 17, they're having these relationships that last 10 days because I'm bored of you already, right? Or somebody else came along or they're talking to five different people. And the minute somebody shows a flaw, they drop them. This is also happening for the, a generation of people who are dating right now with Tinder and hookups. And that's a whole other conversation we'll have in a moment, but mm. it's like, there's no attention span. So 
girls and boys are getting bored of each other in days. So she's now terrified anytime she has a conversation with somebody who's kind of nice that they're just going to drop her, which they're all doing to each other. And I, I know this beyond my conversation with my daughter because I'm, I talk to tons of teenagers and even young adults who are experiencing this right now. So we're talking about this and she went off on this whole, I think she'd be okay with this, um, went this, off on this whole thing about I'm just gonna end up being alone or I'm gonna end up with somebody who treats me like crap just because I don't wanna be alone. And, and my inner, like I wanted to be like, and I actually couldn't control myself. With all that I teach and all that I know, I couldn't control myself. And I started to teach her about, you know, you have to, what you believe is what you be, like I did my whole, bleh, it's like all coming out of my mouth. And she's getting more and more aggravated and more and more irritated. She's like, I don't even know why somebody would talk to you because you're a horrible person to talk to when you're upset. And, and I know that I'm being triggered here in this moment. And, I, and then we ended up getting mad at each other. And then she stormed out of the house. But I know her, like we have a super close relationship. So I knew she was like, outside the front door and I'm like oh I just wanted to go to bed and it's 2 30 in the morning and I don't need this and anyway I ended up like okay stop 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 I'm doing everything everything I am telling my parents that I guide and counsel not to do so I got a grip on myself I took a few breaths put my you know, sweater on and I went outside because I know what does she want she wants me to come looking for her I know she does so, and she, get it go away leave me alone. And like, it's this whole thing. Right. And I'm, and I'm just trying to be present in what I know she needs, which is she needs me to fiercely be present, to listen, to follow her. And then we ended up hugging in the driveway. We went back and I literally just shut my mouth and I listened. And for an hour, she said all of these things. And I just listened. I don't even know that I used the calm technique in that moment. I just, for the first little while, I just listened. I didn't even say anything. I just let her monologue. And then I used the calm technique and then I listened and I mirrored and she's like, mom, that was amazing. That's what I needed. And I'm like, really? Like I do nothing but teach this and write about this. And how did I fall into that trap myself? But it's so powerful. It's so devastating when you see your child suffering. You can't stop yourself sometimes from just like, ah, right. We repaired it. We fixed it, we, and then we snuggled, and we actually, I slept in her bed that night. We slept together. I didn't mean to fall asleep there, but like we're snuggling up, and in the morning, I just kind of gently left and went and got my coffee, and I know that she needed that. And maybe, we ha maybe I had to make all those mistakes in that moment in order for us to get to that vulnerable, beautiful place, right? And then the next day, we had a beautiful day together, but you're gonna blow it. We're all going to blow it, but you get to go back, and you get to repair. The repair is where a lot of the power is right now, going and doing it, doing a do-over, right? I love that. And thank you so much for your honesty, because I know that there, the, the inclination is to, okay, now I know the calm technique. Now I'm just going to do it 100% all the time. And the person who has, it's, it's so refreshing to hear someone who has created this technique sometimes <laughs> fall down and make mistakes. It's like, oh, oh yeah, she is, she is human. So that's, uh, that's good. That's good to know. It's nice to know that, that uh, <laughs> Jennifer is human. So I really appreciate that. Well, thank you. It wasn't a pretty moment. It wasn't my best moment. But it was in, in, it, in all of its, it was imperfectly perfect, you know, in all of its imperfections and you learn something and I do this, like I, we all do it, right? Like I, I read your books. I, de I devour the, the things that you teach with fervor and then I mess it up. Like I, I go and I mess it up and I do the redo thing all the time. It's like, you know what, you know, when I was yelling or losing my temper, or I was telling you how to fix it when I was actually just, I should have just let you sit and figure out the solution yourself. This is what, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. And this is why, you know, so there's, there's a beauty in, in sure. everything that you just shared. So I, I just thank you for that. That was well, thank you. And it, show, it really is a good example of what we talked about that through some mistakes can come some beautiful moments, right. Yeah. And be really yeah. forgiving and really understanding with yourself. And that's, just being real. And listen, if you use the calm technique your whole life and you never yelled at anyone and you used all of the other, you know, beautiful parenting strategies that are never made any mistakes, you're going to mess your kid up anyway. Cause they're going to have a boss or a mother-in-law or somebody who's not going to do that. And they're not going to have any hardware, no neurological uh, network to deal with it. So that's all part of it. Right. And it, it, it's part of, um, that's why when you line up with love and that I could certainly go back and talk about with the, with the, my fear got triggered and that moment and every single word that came out of my mouth that was coming from a place of fear made the situation worse. And it wasn't until I regrouped 
and lined back up with love. Um, it was in that moment that I was able to make, you know, have an entirely different conversation for the second half of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, and getting a grip in the situation that is not always easy to do. Like sometimes you do need that moment where somebody stomps away or you slam the door, or they slam the door. And then you can sort of take a moment and be like, wait a second, what am I doing this? I'm reacting to my child. I am not responding to my child. I need to find that fierce mama love, right? Or papa love that just takes you to that place where you know you can do the superhuman. If your child was ill, if something horrendous was happening to them medically, you would do anything and everything you could to figure out what you do to save them. Emotionally, this is what you need to do. You need to find it. You need to dig deep and you need to put your own fear aside and you need to line up with love and you need to be able to find that coherence in yourself and, and really, and when you do, it flows and it feels better. It feels so different and it feels so much more powerful. So for a lot of us who are control freaks, right? Who want to control everything, right? You can't control conditions ever, especially not with your children. There's mm -hmm. just way too many events that you can't have any control over, but you can control your emotional response to them and that you model. So back to the very first question you asked me, how do you get, get your child to make good choices? you make the best choices you can yourself. I and mean, when you don't, you repair them. You lead by example, right? You show your child what it means to parent from a place of love. You show them that. They will watch you. They will see you. You don't have to sit down and have a conversation about it. They'll know it because you're parenting them that way. And that's the bar that they will set for themselves. And can we, I guess, a sort of a follow-on question to that is, can we teach our children, our teenagers, the calm technique? Can we actively teach them how to connect and how to, um, uh, you know, how to listen and how to mirror? Are we able, is that something that is, that you recommend to teach your teenager how to, you know, whether it's for, the, for their interactions with you or their interactions with their peers? Mm -hmm. Well, and it, it literally is a superpower and it will help them in, incredibly in life but you don't have to teach them. There's no lesson. There's no, now C stands for Like you wouldn't do that. <laughs> you live it. You I, live I probably it. would. I'd be like, C stands for this and A stands for this. As soon as you, <laughs> that, you. <laughs> as soon as you do that, you've lost them. I would have a slide deck. I'd be like, okay guys, we're going to learn <laughs> Jennifer Gillari's work. <laughs> so the truth is probably, and this is the saddest part of being a parent. If you try to teach it, they probably won't listen. Maybe sometimes they will. Yeah. Right. Um, they may listen to someone else. This is why I think it is so helpful, especially if you know your child is, is, is struggling with something, to ha that they have a person, that they have a life coach or they have a therapist. It's, I mean, there's so many negative uh, connotations and people are like, oh, my child's in therapy, but uh, like they don't teach this stuff in school. Mm. There's, there are phenomenal tools that, that would help and coach. And uh, just like having an academic tutor in some ways, um, teenagers there's so many layers when you try to teach your child something that you have to sift through. And it's not that you can't, it's just sometimes they won't, they'll listen to another adult or an aunt or a older cousin or someone much more than they will listen to you. But the, the real answer is you don't have to, you have to do it. You have to live it. They need to experience it. And as they experience it, they will naturally and intuitively do this with others. That's how children learn. Even teenagers, they are learning by example. So the minute you make it a teaching moment, you've, you've ruined it. <laughs> right. right. Oh, right. It's like saying, God. go, go and be athletic. And they, like, they, like their children, their parents sit on the couch and have Cheetos all day. It's like, they will, they're going to model the behavior that they see. That makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. And, and otherwise you'll get eye rolling. I don't need your voodoo. I don't want to hear about your latest person that you're following. I like they just, right. So right. just live right. it, live it, show it, let them experience it. That's how you teach them. And again, you have to not, you have to be confident in yourself and confident enough your child because your fear is going to tell you, you got to write it down and you got to show them videos on it and you have to, no, that's coming from fear. Live it and they will learn it. I love that. Can, I want to talk about a couple of pointed examples around some of the common issues that kids deal with. And we've sort of been talking about it uh, through our conversation, we'd be talking about, you know, anxiety and, and bullying, but I'd like to really zone in. I told you in the pre-chat, I really wanted to talk about sex, um, with teenagers. Cause I think that when we think about sex today and, and maybe this is making me sound, you know, 
my age, I don't know, but um, I think that the view now around sex, especially with teenagers, is that it's not a big deal. You know, oral sex isn't really sex. Uh, there's like hookup parties and all this kind of stuff. And I will tell you full, you know, with full transparency, you know, my partner and I, Giovanni, like we're, we're like, we're passionate, like we're all over each other. Like we're kissing and hugging and his hand is, you know, usually on my butt <laughs> in front of the kids and stuff. And my, my kids have asked me, I mean, my, you know, I have a 15 year old, um, I have a nine and a seven year old just for context. And my young ones are so curious, like my nine and my seven year old, they, um, I remember once my nine year old asking me what, you know, what sex was and, and whatever. So we had a conversation around, and this might not be like, and I'll just preframe this by saying this may not be the core, the values of everybody listening. Like what I'm about to tell you, like this might shock and like, this may be the most abhorrent thing that you've ever heard as a parent. But I explained to him the mechanics of sex, you know, how it works, um, he knows all the proper anatomical, like he knows the difference between a vulva and a vagina. He knows what a urethra is, test, all these things. But the crazy thing is he already knew what sex was. He had heard about it at school and he was testing me. So he was like, what's sex? So I was, and he's like, oh yeah, yeah. That's what like so-and-so said. And I was like, okay. So, and we've also talked about like masturbation and why it's healthy and normal and it feels good and blah, blah, blah. And I, the reason why I have wanted to talk about this is, and I have boys and this may be different when we're, when we're parenting girls or, or not, but in my experience, my conversations with my partner, Giovanni, you know, past partners, whatever, most guys learn about sex from their buddies, which is like highly suspect in terms of the details that are shared or porn, Mm -hmm. right? And porn in my very humble opinion, but it is a strong one, is it in t- so misogynistic. It, it, it portrays the woman in a way that is unrealistic. And these like hookups, these like one, like the, you know, the, the mailman comes to the door and then they're on the couch or on the counter or something. Like it's these, these, this kind of casualness around sex and I wanted to be the first person or, you know, I wasn't because Andreas already knew my, my son already knew about, you know, what sex was, but I, at least I wanted to kind of get in early with my values around sex, because I think that, I mean, my, this is my opinion, but for me, the act of having sex is actually sacred. It's like this energetic, you know, exchange and, you know, from conversations I've had with my friends and my own experience, like one night stands usually suck. Like they are usually the worst experiences and the better, the best sex you've ever had is usually with someone, you know, you're intimate with, there's a connection, there's safety, you can experiment, all these things. So I wanted to kind of discuss this with my boys because, you know, when, when my kids were born, this um, comment was given to me, which I don't agree with, but it was kind of done in jest. It was like, oh, when you have a boy, you know, you just have to worry about, you know, the one penis. When you have a girl, you have to worry about all the other penises like around, right? Or something to that effect. Yeah, but I yeah. wanted, I wanted to imprint on my boys the, the importance of sex, that it is not just like, you can't just go to a hookup party and like, you know, like the house key, you know, like the um, house key parties of, of yesteryear where you'd throw your house keys in and, you know, um, can you, can you speak to, I mean, you can tell me that I'm totally wrong for that. Um, no, but, listen, it, you know, what, so what are your, yeah. so I, I'm fascinated because when people talk about having the birds and the bees talk with their kids, mm-hmm. they already know they've already, I, I can't even, ima- I can't even think of a time in the 30 years I've been doing this where a kid was like, really? Like they've already heard. Either they already know. Yeah. They already know. Yeah. Um, so they're going to get that information in, you know, different ways and skewed ways. Um, one of the things that you picked up on that's so important that I feel really strongly about is I think that porn has absolutely shaped, um, our children's understanding of sex and themselves. Um, and it's, I'm really concerned about it. So the, the reality of the situation is, um, if your child has access to any kind of device, but certainly a smartphone, they have probably already seen porn by the time that they're 11. Mm-hmm. And there are, I, 
shocking plethora of things. It is definitely a misogynist industry and most of the people that are in that industry have been traumatized uh, as children. So it, it's a, it's a, we, that's a whole other conversation, but it has definitely shaped things um, and warped things to a huge, huge degree. So the, the, what happens right now, and it, I'll come back to lining up with love for a second because this, this is important, but the images that they're seeing exactly as you say are, are not real. And that's not the way things work. But kids are, the hookup culture is very prevalent and it is really difficult. And kids will say it's not a big deal, but that's not true. It is a big deal to them. So I talk to the kids who have hooked up and then feel disgusting after. Right, the girl. So the, the they hook up with each other at a quite a young age, um, and then there's supposed to be no relationship, no connection to each other, but they all feel gross about it. Even the boys, mm -hmm. um, they're pretending that they don't, but they're very messed up about this. This is really confusing to them. And with the girls that I talk to, they they either do it because they think that, that that's what everybody does, and they'll be they won't be popular. Um, but when you, but when you do anything from a place of fear, that emotional GPS is going to go off and you're going to feel gross and you're going to feel that you have made a decision so far from that love, which in this case is the, the higher self or your best self or whatever you want to call it, that when you're involved in a situation like that, when you did it because you're afraid and it didn't feel right and it didn't feel great, the, the responding, the corresponding emotion is going to be anxiety, depression, guilt shame why because there's a gap between what i really should have done in that moment when it's a lovely moment and you really like this each other and it feels pure and it feels great and it feels natural and feels normal they're going to feel great about it mm -hmm. right so it's really helping your kids understand if you feel gross about it what's that about right let's let's what's that feeling telling you that's information Right. We, we talk about feelings as these things that we have to get rid of, like emotions are, you know, anxiety is bad. Depression is bad. No, they're in there. It's information. It's telling us something. hundred percent. Why would you just take a pill for that? Like, it, I mean, obviously if it's, if it's taking over your life, there's lots of treatments, but one element of it needs to be, what is this information telling us? What are we supposed to learn from this feeling? Right. Anxiety too gets this bad rap. Like anxiety is bad. Anxiety is absolutely necessary for survival, for good mental health. Like you have, you're going to walk across the street and go, ah, the cars will wait. Like you need anxiety to help guide you. Um, you just have to, you just have to make sure it's not controlling you. Right. So if we come back to this idea, um, kids are not okay with all this. Even if they tell you they're okay, they're not okay. Trust me, they're not. And I've had lots of boys in my office. I can think of two or three young men 16, 17, 20, who were in tears in my office. I ruined my childhood. I was doing stuff sexually that I had no business being a part of. He'll gross now. And, mm -hmm. the, and lots of boys, this is a new pho uh, phobia that I'm seeing, that are, they can't sleep at night because they're thinking, did I touch a girl that didn't want to be touched? Is she going to come back and tell me that I'm, I, I abused that her? That I raped her or something. Oh yeah. my God, I can't tell you how many young boys are absolutely uh, in, uncontrollably obsessed with this idea, like a, like a new form of OCD. Um, and then, and girls are having their own kind of experiences with it. Um, so that's a really important piece. So it is important to have these conversations with your kid, real conversations, give them a, a sense of what, what sex really is and what it should be like. And that what you're seeing in those, on those images are, that's traumatic. That's not healthy, normal. No, that's, that's, a, anyway, that's, that's a big problem. That's a really big problem. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to say something else about that though. I was going to talk about porn. What was I going to say? Because it's really important. Um, oh, hookups. So the other thing that's happening, so parents of girls out there, you have to know how your boys are behaving online. It is beyond shocking. It is seconds before they're asking girls for nudes. Like seconds. Like you talk to any girl, 13, 14 and up, and they are dealing with this sexual harassment on multiple, multiple times a day. And we have no idea as parents that this is happening. Every girl that I talked to, Olivia tell, told me this. She's like, it's, if, if a guy doesn't ask her for a nude in like the first few seconds, she's like, what's going on now? She, she is 
very aligned with herself and we've done a lot of education on not putting not doing that and that that's out there you can never take it back that's not the part of the conversation that we want to focus on although that's another part which we'll talk about in a moment how to help your girls with that but that the part i want people to focus on is there that's what it's like out there for girls right now they are mm. bombarded multiple times a day with really aggressive uh demeaning um requests all the time and then got and boys sending pictures of themselves right dick pics mm -hmm. are a thing like yeah. we ha we have to know what's going on in our teenagers world this is what they're dealing with right you need to be having these conversations with your girls and with your boys w why is it okay so why what does that conversation look like so you have a daughter what what's the conversation with her around and then even just the rules around kind of sexting right like that also plays into the sex as well because it's like well is that you know what is that so how what what's the conversation look like with our bo with our girls and with with our boys i'm i'm so this the is, first this is part the first part again is that you don't start with fear what how do i know you're safe and i'm just gonna have to take the computer out of your room if this is what's happening if that's your reaction you've just <laughs> you've messed it up and they're never going to figure out because all you're doing is delaying because talk to anybody in their 20s and 30s. Talk to people in their 40s and 50s dating online. It's the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Within seconds, there it gets disgusting. It, it's just the strangest world, the virtual world. It's like all there's all different rules and these different personas. It's very strange. So the first part is just letting them vent and creating safety in the conversation using the calm techniques. So go back to the first podcast where you're really just present and listening without fear and suspending your own agenda <laughs> and what, and, and just saying, and, and making comments like, Oh my God, like, what is that like for you to just like the second you think a guy is nice and then they ask you for that. It's like pff, gone, like really without fear, having this moment where you're just really connecting around what that experience is, you'll know in a conversation when it's time to move towards some kind of resolution, what can we do about it? Because your child will turn to you, your teenager will say, well, did that happen when you were a kid? And the truth is, no, not really. I mean, there were different versions of it, much milder versions of it, but not to the degree that teenagers have to deal with it now. But they'll ask you like, what should I do? And what do you think? Then you can have the conversation about lining up with yourself. You have to know that when you have those feelings, that's your own body telling you, this isn't right for me. Help them tune into that intuition. We, that's something we don't talk about in our culture at all. Like, but so many ancient cultures, and, and if we listen to our heart's coherence, right? Our, our own sense of what feels right and what doesn't, if we could just learn to quiet ourselves, we have wisdom and so do our kids. And we can connect and line that wisdom up together in these beautiful conversations, but you've got to keep fear out of it. The minute you want to get that finger out, you're, you're losing the thread yeah. of the conversation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that may be, that's going to be multiple conversations. It's not going to be one conversation, right? And there's going to be parts of the conversation where you just check with your child and say, are you just venting? Like, do you need me to say anything? Or do you need to just vent this out? Like, that's such a great thing, whatever the topic is. Are you just venting? Do you just need me to just let you, right? The minute you start to try and problem solve when they're not ready, you're going to lose focus in the conversation. And it could be multiple conversations. And then it is through example. It is through being affectionate and loving with your, with your spouse or your partner um, so that your kids can see what real love and real connection looks like, right? That it's beautiful and it's healthy and it's, it's something we should be aspiring to. Um, have conversations if you're watching TV shows and programs with your kids, which you should be. Every, every one of us should have shows that we're watching with our teenagers so we can have conversations about it. So, and, and sometimes it's just about the characters. It's not now, now look at so-and-so. Now she's making that decision. But the minute you do it like that, they're not going to, can you believe that? Oh my God, why would she do that? He just, that kind of conversation, mm -hmm. right? real and um, immersed in what you're watching and, and looking at together. Um, so that's how the conversation looks. And I, I wish I could give you more of a map. Like parents often say to me, like, can you give me a script? No, because it has everything to do with what your, the person just said to you, right? So it's, you can use the calm technique, you can summarize, you can clarify, you can paraphrase. Um, so, you know, if I think about Olivia, if she's like every single guy mom, like you can't believe it. Like within a few seconds, they're, they're asking for a nude. I can paraphrase that. So every single guy, like it does, and just when you think they're nice, that Okay, I can do it like that. 
I can clarify like, well, what is it they're asking for? Like how, how do they ask you? Right. I can summarize. Oh my God. Every single time. Doesn't matter. You, so you use the, the, you can use the, and, and listen, it's all in our first podcast, right? The, the, yep. we're in, it's a skill and it takes practice, yep. but that's the formula. And that keeps guiding you back to that moment where you're present. And when you're lined up with love and compassion and empathy, which is healing. And, and then you're going to have, you basically, you want to be the kind of parent that your child wants you to talk to, right? If you're this, they're never going to want to talk to you. Or if you're scared or if you're crying yourself, which is okay. There's moments where that has to happen. But if your child can feel your own pain and panic and trauma around this, and you're linking back to whatever experiences you, they, they cannot handle your pain and theirs. Yeah. So, it, and it may not mean that they don't love you or they're severing their relationship with you. They can't handle your stuff and theirs at the same time simultaneously. So you have to be, you have to find that way to be present. And I've had so many, thousands of families that I've worked with over the years that have had all kinds of things happen in their lives who have learned through this method, even though they have their own trauma. And I always recommend to get support and help for your own issues, but everyone, mo most people have been able to do it. It is doable. It's hard, but it's doable because yeah. mamas, especially dads too, can do anything for their child, anything. And I think that there's also clues, right? Like your teenager, even though they may not be able to come to you and say, Hey, listen, you know, I have this thing, every single guy that I think is nice within a couple of seconds, like they have their own way of sending us distress signals. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe, and let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the kind of, you know, and I think this is different for girls and boys. Uh, you know, men, I find, less verbal, right? Like they tend to kind of shut down. Um, what are some, what are some, and this, this may be not necessarily in the context of sex, but when we are thinking about, you know, maybe my, my teenager is struggling or maybe there's, maybe I need to foster connect. What are some of the distress signals that a teenager will flare up in, in terms of letting us know that they are not okay? Yeah. And the first part of that answer, because my answers are always complicated, is you have to figure out what's a distress signal and what's not right? So especially if we're talking about girls, there are certain stages that they go through as they're figuring out who they are, right? So you'll see with like nine-year-olds, they start to be obsessed with, I need a bra. I need a bra and I, I'm probably going to get my period and it's years before they will. There's this sort of practicing of what it's going to look like, right? Then there's often a stage where they go backwards and I call it the My Little Pony stage. So around 11, they start to want to go back and watch things they watched when they were little. They just don't want to talk about being a teenager. They'll, they'll start watching program show, you know, that they did when they were little and go back to being little kids. That is not necessarily a distress signal. That's a normal thing of like, I'm going to, I'm going to contract before I expand. expand right. Mm -hmm. So, and if you know that there's kind of these, these things that you're going to look for, cause you could say, Oh, what does that mean? They're, you know, retreating into being a baby. No, they're just pulling backwards before they go forwards. Right. And then right around 12 or 13, they become obsessed with makeup, foundation and makeup. And parents can, if you react from fear, you look terrible and that's going to ruin your skin and you look like a prostitute. And whatever we're saying to our kids, as they're trying to figure out their relationship with this, you can see that as a distress signal. Are they covering themselves up? Like, are they, are they trying to attract boys in a different way? But there's often a, an exploration right around seventh, eighth grade around wearing too much makeup. So what comes back to is the same theme, which is getting your child to pay attention. What, and having deep conversations about what is that makeup providing for them? Are they practicing? Do they want to feel like what it's like to be you know, a teenager? Are they embarrassed of their zits? Are they trying to fit in? Like ha when you start having conversations, if you're putting makeup on because it's fun and you're enjoying it and you want to figure out what it's like to be a teenager, that's okay. If you're afraid to go out without a face full of makeup, that's not okay. Right. So when you're the kind of parent where your child will start to tell you and be vulnerable with you, now you're going to be able to have conversations about. Um, and I remember I remember Olivia going through this stage and it often coincides with acne. Right. So they become really obsessed with covering up the acne. And of course, the more you put makeup on and they're little, so they don't wash it off properly. And the more they do that, the more the, the worse the acne gets. Right. 
So it's lots of love in those stages and lots of baby play and connection and deep conversations. And then how do you really feel with that makeup on? And does it really feel okay? And most of the time the stage, then they just stop. Then they cut it out, they don't wear makeup at all. But if you fight with them through that stage, you're gonna make that stage longer and you're also gonna have some lasting, not trauma, but upset that goes along with it. They're also trying to figure out who they are, right? And then they also go through a stage where they're dressing differently. And boys go through their own stages here, like the, the, the hoods over the head, right? Like Hygiene. Hygiene. I think it's a hygiene for the right. boys, at least my experience. We'll talk about that. Stinky teenagers not wanting to take showers. Like yeah. Part of it is no, nose blindness. Part of it is rejecting who they are and growing up and being afraid of girls and being afraid of, of contact. So if I stink, <laughs> no one's going to want to be around me. Um, that's a different conversation. But again, these aren't necessarily distress signals, right? So you, you don't want to over, you don't want to put that on every single um, new behavior that your child is displaying as a teenager. And this is why conversation, open conversation and having a relationship with your child is so important. Real distress signals are things like suddenly not wanting to do things that they did before, like really seriously withdrawing. Uh, if you think your child is cutting, which is a whole thing, I mean, that's a whole other podcast, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the cutting and the, the, the most distressing thing to me is what teenagers are talking about. And they are all, not all, but a lot of them are having these deep, heavy, like I'm depressed and I've been cutting and I have anxiety and I'm going to see my therapist. And they're all on the, they're trying to find a way to have an important existence and have something that they bear, right? And, and the conversations that they're having with each other about suicide and cutting, and these, are, these are kids who parents have no idea that this is what their, their teenagers are talking about. And they're carrying these burdens of, I have to call my friend tonight because she said she was suicidal last night and, and they're, I'm the only one she can talk to and these heavy conversations that they're trying to manage because kids are shutting off and not talking to their parents, so they're talking to each other. And there's some histrionic stuff in there. There's some fear-based stuff in there. There's some attention seeking in there and there's some real stuff in there. And it is messy and way too hard for a 16 year old or a 15 year old or a 14 year old to figure out. Um, so there's, I mean, I, I don't mean to terrify parents, but <laughs> this is the stuff that's happening. This is why having a connected relationship with your child so they feel safe enough to come to you. Mm -hmm. So like Olivia will come to me and say, I just had a conversation with my friend. What do I do? And, and I can have a whole mirroring conversation with her and then say, sweetheart, that's not something you should, that's not your job. Yeah. You're not a therapist. Mm -hmm. You're not even an adult. Let's figure out what we need to do for that person. So we make sure that the adults in their life are aware and they know what to do. Right. And, and a lot of the teenagers are, are, they're even aware to a point of that it's history on it. They know that there, there's a, there's a, part of this that this is all just a desperate see me you know i'm carrying something i have a burden i'm not alone um it, it's very 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 complex right and and even kids who are very privileged who have a lot of stuff to be happy about feel a lot of guilt about that so they will often accentuate things that, have, that they think they've gone through in their lives that are really hard and difficult in order to justify their life seeming really easy. The complexity in life right now and in teenagers' lives is, it's very deep. And, and the, the panic that may, parents may be feeling right now, it, I want you to know that it is mitigated by this closeness, right? By lining up with love and leading by example and, and not parenting from a place of fear. That, you, you, that is an important role that you play in your child's life. And that's why you have to push past the fear to be the person they want to come to, to be the person they want comfort from, even though they slam the door and say, get out, leave me alone. Right. You got to keep coming back because that's what they need. And that's actually what they want. Is it, is it ever okay to negotiate with our kids? Depends. Like, what do you mean about what? So let's think, uh, let's think about, you know, there's a, you know, a house party or, you know, the kids, like there's like some social event that they want to go to and um, there's going to be no adults there. And you, for whatever reason, are not comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. Are there, you know, sometimes things are not just yes and no, there's, you know, hundreds shades of gray, right? Mm -hmm. Is it ever okay for us to 
say to our kids, no, this is not, I, I'm not comfortable with you going to this house party where there's going to be no adults or there's going to be no adult supervision. But what I am okay with is you going for, you know, a couple of hours and then maybe I'll come and pick you up. Like, is, is, is there, is there ever any room for, for that? Like when we're, when we're trying to set boundaries for our children, when we're saying, listen, I'm not comfortable with you, you're 14 or you're 15 or whatever age you are. It's not okay for you to be alone without adult supervision with a bunch of other teenagers, at least for my comfort level right now, even though I understand how important this is socially for you. Mm -hmm. Is there ever a place for us to, uh, is there a place for give and take? And And I don't mean this in like, you know, can you can you just cut on Mondays and Wednesdays and not be, like that's ridiculous? That's not what I mean. But I mean, you know that I think like that when we think about anorexia, we think about bulimia, we think about suicide. Like these are things that require not only your own connection, but I think that the, you require uh, external help as well there. But for things that like day to day teenagery stuff, yeah, yeah. The answer is yes. You, of course you need to set limits. They don't have a fully front form frontal lobe. You are not mean, you're a frontal lobe, right? And if you're, and again, you line up with love first. If it's your own issue, oh, I'm scared they're not going to be handling it. I'm scared that people are going to think I'm a terrible mother for sending them there. And I'm, you first figure out what you're, where you're coming from. Mm-hmm. And if you know that it's based in love, they're not ready. There are no adults there. It's too much for my child at this age. I don't think it's a good idea. And you know that in your soul, like, you have that brain heart coherence around it. You will be able to say no and you'll be able to do it in the most loving, impactful, strong way. And you'll be able to do it in a way that believe it or not, when you say no to your teenagers, usually there's, there's a bit of a flare up and then they leave it. It's usually much less of a big deal as you think it's going to be. When the big deal comes from, I don't know, and maybe and you're not ready for this and the fights that happen around it but if if they think there's a maybe in there they're going to not leave you alone but if you say i love you enough to say no and i love you enough for you to be mad at me i believe that you are not ready for this and i love you way too much to let you go to that party and you have permission to be as mad at me as you need to be slam all the slam all the doors you want to you're not going there's a comfort and there's a relief that comes from that sometimes with teenagers that they'll stomp and then it's over and you'll think, Oh my God, they're going to be mad at me for two weeks. And then two hours later, they're like, where's the welcome? We don't have any cereal. And they're fine. Right. Mm -hmm. So often it's way less of a big deal than we think it's going to be. And that's in my experience of 30 years of helping parents with their teenagers. That's most often the case. Um, So again, you have to sort of line up with, with, with your own sense of, of, of operating from love and fear there. Um, if you think, well, I got to let them do it sometime and maybe there's some parameters, you could work together. Then the conversation becomes, how can we work together to make this a yes? It's like, what do we need to do to make this a yes? Like, what can I, pick? I, I will be picking you up and you better answer your phone every half an hour. And let's have a signal where I call you and we have it worked out that if you go, oh, come on, mom, seriously, really? That means I hate this party. I'm scared. It's too much for me. Come get me. Right. There's all kinds of cool ways you can have them, the, the child, throw, oh, my parents are so mean. I got to go. You can have a whole plethora of things worked out so that they can leave that party. The most important thing, though, comes down to four words. Is it four? Yeah. I believe in you. I believe in you. Yes. I believe in you. Right. That's really important. I believe in you. I know who you are. I know you're tuned into your best self. I know that you know what the right thing to do is. And I believe you may, that may waver sometimes, but I believe in you, right? Send them off if they go in that way to the party and back to the first part of our conversation. Don't do this all the way there. Now, remember, if if it has that energy, it's like, baby, you've got this. You know, I'm out here. It's fine. We've got our signal. Go be you. Go do you. Listen to your, listen to your, be your best self in there. Right. And that's not necessarily going to look the way you want it to, but it's going to look a whole lot better than you're fearing for sure. Right. right? And, and it's teaching them that they can be shaping their lives. They can know themselves. They can make decisions that they're and and those feelings you're going to have after. Right. So a big one that comes up a lot is when kids drink. Right. So they get drunk, they're vomiting. They're, I just had this this week with a client. Kid was throwing up. I somehow got together with other teenagers. I don't even know how that happened in this particular day and age, but it did. Um, 
absolutely vomiting and ended up going to the hospital. Parents are at the hospital with this kid in the middle of this whole virus thing. Um, and the, it's interesting because the hospitals and the paramedics always give this advice. They're like, take pictures, take pictures because they won't remember this. <laughs> so take pictures. Um, and I always say to the family, when the child comes home, obviously make sure they're safe, make sure that they're not in any kind of danger, but don't become Florence Nightingale. Make like, them let them feel them. it. Let, let them feel it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Let them feel it. And then have oh. a conversation about this feeling, both, both physically, which is information, that's your body telling you that's poison. And emotionally, I feel like an idiot. I'm embarrassed. I don't want to be that person. I'm disgusted with myself. Those feelings are so important. Don't drown those out. That's your GPS. That's how you're going to remember you don't want to be this person next time, right? And alcohol is a tricky one because there's a lot of like, oh, it's a rite of passage. Everybody goes through that. Alcohol is not so bad. Um, alcohol is extremely dangerous. And there are tons of kids every year that get very, very sick and or die from alcohol poisoning. Um, so you got to watch that. And there's lots of parents buying alcohol for their kids, like, like head slap. Really? Why are you doing that? It's, there's a reason why teenagers shouldn't be drinking. It's because they can't regulate. Even adults can't regulate their drinking. Very well. Yeah. Alcohol is a funny one because I, I grew up in a, uh, my, my uh, father and his side of the family is Portuguese. So wine was, they made wine in their backyard. It was always at the dinner table and I would have a sip here and there. Like it was never like, it was just like, ah, this is like the, the juice that the parents drink. I never really liked it. So when it came time for me to, and I wonder if this is, cause I, I, I see this a lot and I don't know the data in Europe and European culture. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know what the data is, but I feel like for me, my experience when it was like, okay, you know, when we were of age and we were able to drink, like, I didn't really care. It was like, well, whatever. I've been having a sip of wine from my dad for right. forever. So like, who cares? Difference, right? So yeah. in, in communities where alcohol is there and people drink at a young age, there's not this forbidden fruit thing. Yeah. Right? So kids didn't go to parties and drink till they vomited because it's like, why? It's, why? Right? So in the West, for sure, in the United States and in Canada, I think in the United States, it's 21 drinking age. Canada's 19. Uh, Anyway, I think it's the forbiddenness that, that makes it a huge deal. Yeah. So it's, I don't mean like you can't have wine sometimes. And if it's no big deal and you raise your kids like that, they'll probably be much better off when they go to parties when it's a super forbidden thing. But no, I don't want people to think you've got to give your kids alcohol. Yeah, no, right. that's not, that's not what we're saying. We're not saying go and give your, put it in your kid's baby bottle. Like that's right. not, it's that's not the thing. It's, it, but I just found culturally, because when I, when I would have other you know, I grew up in Canada, so other Canadian friends, and they're like, ah, oh, we're going to go get blitzed. And I'm like, oh my God, why? Like, I, I did not identify right. or and relate to that. It's true. But now it is this thing. And you'll see it primarily grade nine. It even starts in grade eight. It'll even start in grade seven. But grade nine and grade 10 tend to be the big years where they're sneaking alcohol and they're throwing up. And if they're going to do that it's kind of stupidness, it's there by grade 11 and grade 12, they tend to like focused on university now and they're kind of over it. They've matured a little bit. There's mm -hmm. a whole drinking culture in university, which is another conversation, but oh, yeah. you yeah. don't see as many kids kind of having to go to the hospital kind of deal at that age. It still happens, but it, it's a primarily a thing that I see more of in kind of ninth grade, 10th grade kind of age. And it has to do with it um, being this illicit thing, this forbidden thing. Um, but there are parents who are buying alcohol for their kids. And they say, well, I'd rather them drink at home than at these parties. And, and these are decisions that you have to make. But the real conversation needs to be, why do you feel like you have to drink with your friends? Yeah, yeah. What's going on inside? And how do you find your, how do you listen to your higher self, to your real self, right? The self that's connected to what's really right in this situation. Um, and, and the part of yourself that just wants to explore and experiment and figure out what it means versus the part of you who wants to get, you know, messed up and act like an idiot and drown your sorrows, right? Those are, those are very, very different things, which is why we come back to the importance of this conversation. Pot is a whole other conversation because it's legal now, right? So, and it has a whole other set of concerns about it. And what's primarily happening now is that kids are using marijuana to self-medicate for anxiety, probably. Um, like anxiety. Yeah. yeah. Lots of ADHD kids are using it. Mm -hmm. 
and it's an easy, quick way to stop your brain from racing. And I am now seeing parents who are buying marijuana for their kids. So it's, it's as always, the, the humans are messy and parenting is messy, right? But where it comes back to is exactly the thing that I keep saying over and over again. Right? It's it being that, um, being the, the person that your kids are oriented to. Be, be that full uh, uh, spectrum parent so that they don't have to fill that hole somewhere else. Right. And that's, and they're still going to do some of that stuff, but the, the whole, the, the vacuum inside that they're trying to kill some feeling you can do, you can plug that up with love, with connection. There is so much evidence that connection is the antidote to addiction. Like it's really the, the whole, um, all of the latest research in addiction is really showing that, that it comes yeah. down to addiction. And I think what you're talking about is really just a, a, like developing a skill set in these teenagers where they can begin to attune with how they feel. And so, I mean, this is prevalent in adults. I had Dr. Kelly Brogan on the podcast. We were talking about depression. She's a psychiatrist. We we're talking about depression. Oh, we works. are so afraid to feel our feelings as adults that we don't know how to teach that skill set to our children, to our teenagers. So I think that you know everything you're saying. So it's just been such a wealth of information, and I I will link uh, Jennifer to the uh, to your teenage to the book uh, "You're Ruining sure. My Life," <laughs> which was a great read um, with lots of robust examples. In all, you know we've talked about sex, we've talked about drugs, a little bit of anxiety. You you go through the whole gamut, right? Like why children, like why kids lie, why they procrastinate, all these different. Um, you know, permutations of teenage behavior and how to make sense of it. Um, I'm just, I'm looking at the clock. We've reached two hours yet no, again. No, we did not. I was yeah. thinking an hour. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. okay. Any, any final thoughts, any final um, uh, thoughts in terms of just wrapping up our, our wonderfully colorful conversation today? No, I think just be, be nice. Be, in order for any of this to really work, you, you have to use the calm technique on yourself. Honestly, you have to show that same compassion, that same love, that same understanding to yourself in order to do it properly. That's the first thing. Really start having conversations in the family that, that emotions are information. Just like physical pain is information. You stub your toe. Oh, I, shouldn't, I should be careful walking through that you know, area again, right? Emotional um, responses are the same. What is it telling you? And lining up with love, that, that's... That honestly, I think is the, is the biggest takeaway I hope from today. And yeah. that's where you have, that's where all your power is. And when you, if you are a control freak and you want to control everything, control that. Because I will usually lead you back to the right answer, no matter what we're talking about, whether it's drugs or sex or drinking or pot or whatever it is, it's going to take you back to the core, which is uh, lining up with your higher self and lining up with love. Everything you've said is just absolutely spectacular. And I know this is going to help a lot of people. So I just want to thank you again uh, for your time. And I am looking forward to when this whole thing is over, I can get on a plane, come see you and give you just the biggest hug because you are such a wonderful person. I would love that. I would really love that. And thank you. Thank you so much for believing in this work. My, my dream really is to kind of heal the planet one home at a time. And yeah. I think this is, I really do believe this is a way to do it. So if people want to know more, know more than go to connectedparenting.com. I have yes. a podcast on iTunes, which I go deeper into this information. And then I have a, an online parenting course, which is really turning out to be an amazing community of people because there's a Facebook group that goes with that, a closed Facebook group, and online coaching calls with me. And families are now at different stages of that's all helping each other. And it's just turning into the most wonderful group of people that are all supporting each other. So if you want to dive deeper, because it's easier said than done, all of this, um, then that's another way to do it too. Wonderful. And I'll make sure that that link uh, you. to your website and to the course is also in the show notes as well. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Jen.